Hi, I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell, and I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. This video marks the beginning of book two of Nietzsche's Will to Power. I've been going through uh, systematically uh, an analysis, note by note, of uh, Nietzsche's Will to Power, and I've also invited um, viewer contribution, and I've gotten quite a bit of viewer contribution. My last contribution came from um, Ian Mathwis Seven and one from Complacency Among Us both of which did uh, a very extended discussion of the notes that I had outlined, um, totaling roughly about an hour and a half worth of um, video lecture that they gave, um, to which I consolidated to about 30 minutes. Um, I've incorporated the links to their discussion in the PDF, so just click the PDF, it'll take you to their videos. You can watch their videos and have um, an assessment of what they interpreted uh, notes 135 to 139 to be. Again, as I said, my intent in doing these video lectures is not just me as the educator, as the academic presenting the information, but to get the community collectively to present the information. Um, I've changed up my style for book two because book two is so extended. What I'm going to do is I've already shot, um, um, not shot, but I've already taken 100 notes worth of notes. So um, 140 begins the notes, and I'm already today on note 240, but I'm going to do 100 note sections at a time. Um, take, 100, um, take notes on 100 notes, and then shoot video for 100 notes, take notes on 100 notes, shoot video for 100 notes, and so on. Um, this will give people who are further behind in the series time to catch up, and also if you want to stay up to date with the the, the notes, then just click the link to my Facebook page and you can get updates when I update notes, um, my RSS feed and so on. And, uh, and that's basically it. So with that, let's begin. Uh, and this is section 8 on page 25 of Nietzsche's Will to Power. So this is, uh, and this is section 8. Um, so as we said, this is um, the my first installment of book two. Uh, both Ian Math with seven and Complacency Among Us began the section of um, book two. And basically what we learned in their contribution, I'm not going to rehash it because they went through it, but was a recognition of Nietzsche's disdain for the role that the um, sort of religious orthodoxy has had on social hierarchy, has had on um, bestowing um, tremendous amounts of power on the priests, and so on. Um, what we're going to do now is look at notes 140 to 141. So the first thing to recognize that, um, in this section is the philosopher is, has inherited, right? The philosopher has inherited his method from the priest, right? So uh, the philosopher has inherited his method from the priest. But the philosopher has inherited his method from the priest. What we're going to recognize is that the philosopher, right, the philosopher has learned how to be a philosopher, right? The philosopher has learned how to be a philosopher from the priest, right? And we've seen some of the bestowments that the priest has gotten, right? We recognize, and we know, oh, another quick point. Um, I'm also going to go through these notes um, and look for new information or information that's going to facilitate my intent in this lecture series. I'm not going to continually rehash sort of the collapse of the highest values, the fact that the priestly class and the religious class um, is an anti-biological class, the fact that they, um, they um, devalue all biological, all physiological in favor for an other world and afterlife and so on. Uh, I mean, that's been rehashed to death through book one. So I'm going to go through those notes um, rather quickly and get to the information to construct some new concepts in this section, right? So we know what categorizes 
the priesthood class. And what Nietzsche is saying is that the philosopher has learned his method from the priest, right? So that the method of the philosopher, right? The method of the philosopher via hypothetical syllogism, the method of the philosopher comes from the priestly class, and all of the problems of the priestly class become problems of the philosopher, right? This dualism, this um, sort of uh, platonic, if you will, transcendental view, worldview, and so on. Okay, so the condition for the existence of the philosopher priest, right? And this is sort of my um, conception, philosopher dash priest. So we're going to talk about conditions, and actually I should put it over here. Conditions for the philosopher So what are some of the conditions for the philosopher slash priest? The first condition is people believe in the superiority of their God, right? That's um, note 140, and I actually want to read that, right? Belief in the supremacy of their God. All right, so let's turn to, again, I'm using... Uh, Frederick Nietzsche's Will to Power. This is uh, edited and translated by Walter Kaufman. And we'll go to notes 140 and see what he has to say. Okay. Um, right at the beginning of note 140. The philosopher has a further development of the priestly type, has the heritage of the priests in his blood, has inherited the, the method of the priest in his blood is compelled, even as rival, even as his rival, to struggle for the same ends with the same means as a priest of his time. He aspires to supreme authority, right? So this idea of um, supremacy, obviously we recognize that the priest is going to make an appeal, an appeal to God. And we're going to see what the philosopher makes an appeal to. It varies, right? This idea of supremacy varies, but depending on what philosophy you talk about, um, you can say that the philosopher makes an appeal to reason, right? You can say that the, the philosopher makes an appeal to experience. You can say that the philosopher makes an appeal to consistency, right? Um, granted, as Nietzsche just said, there is this sort of antithetical relationship, this, in a sense, polemic relationship between the philosopher and the priestly class, um, he says, just to say it again, um, has the heritage of the priest in his blood, is compelled even as rivals, right? So this rivalry, right? Even as rivals, the philosopher, right? The philosopher and the priest, even as rivals, the philosopher has inherited his method from the priestly class, right? Um, the method, I mean, we know um, sort of the contributions that St. Thomas Aquinas, um, uh, Anselm, and so on have made to philosophical discourse, albeit within the terms within terms of um, Christian orthodoxy, but that methodological, regimented, formalized, narrativized structure of systematic analysis um, is, in a sense, inherited from the priestly class. Um, number two, they, the priests, are the only means of accessing God, right? So this is one of the conditions for the philosopher priest. They, the priests, are the only means of accessing God. They, and that's the priest, are the only means of and I'll put truth, right? They, the priestly class, are the only means of accessing God, um, that is, the truth. To read along, next paragraph in uh, note 140, what, and I'm not gonna go through and read, you guys sort of know my method now, having watched <laughs> 14 hours worth of, of, of lecture. Um, and, and pretty soon I'm coming up, I'm approaching the goal. I've already passed, um, just as a quick tangent, I've already passed, um, <laughs> 